Charles. Welcome to Casual Space. Thank you, Beth. Great to be here. It's so good to see you. I was blown away. Your enthusiasm when I got to meet you at recently in May back in DC at Humans to Mars, it was like a kid in a candy store. You were so excited to unveil something very new that we're about to do today together on the show. Where before we even talk about this incredible centennial that you were going to celebrate in such a big way, where did your love of space begin? Well, I think it began very early um, with uh, science fiction on television. I think it was a series, Men in Space. Uh huh. Then Disney actually had Werner von Braun yes. talking about how we're going to get to the moon, etc. Um, but I think it really kicked off certainly um, at the New York World's Fair in 1964. Okay. So you know, being a 12 year old kid in Brooklyn, I could take the bus out to out to the fair and see what the future was going to reveal. Um, it was at a time where the world was really in terrible chaos. There were terrible uh, race riots and yeah. assassinations and poverty. Uh, and uh, Vietnam War was uh, gearing up that it was nice to have something really positive and hopeful about the future. Um, and space was a big feature of the 64 World's Fair. It was yes. really just the space race was on full, full fledged. So I got to go each weekend by myself and kind of have the sense of wonder. But I think more, more importantly, hopefulness. You know, I've always ended up being a very hopeful person. And I think space was always part of that. It kind of brought out the best in human beings. I I, I love Bill Nye's quote, um, space brings out the best in us. Oh my I, gosh. I, I just put that bumper sticker on the other yeah, side of the camera because yeah. it was oh, cool. <laughs> it was just behind me, but it was laying down and it's starting to curl from the sun just sitting in here. <laughs> I got to get it on my car. Yeah, yeah. Charles, well, that's yeah. incredible. Yeah, there... well, he, he, you know, he nailed it, you know, certainly. Yeah, sure. totally. Um, and then especially, I was always a science-oriented kid. I love science. My father was a physician in that golden age of medicine. Uh, we had his, his office in our house. No. Um, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So um, Sick so, patients yeah. and people came into your house. And, right, right. Oh, and we, wow. Well, um, but certainly, you know, uh, landing on the moon was certainly seminal, like a lot of folks. But but I've been following space and science fiction since since I was a young kid. And when you saw your father doing amazing things, were you, um, did you have siblings? Did you all witness I, I, this? I have a sister. Yep. And did uh, they, it re, did they invite you to participate or help or like go get a bandage or assist in things or like. Not, not so much, not so much, but we, you know, we had lunch with the, my father's nurses in our kitchen every day, oh. around. but it was very sweet. He was one of those, you know, doctors. I don't think he raised his rates in 30 years. And it was, it was, oh it was my very, gosh. You know, I still, I still have a lot of positive feelings for medicine for that, but wow. And now the idea of a house called the doctor or a doctor out of the house yeah. is like a luxury. It would be amazing. It was like the norm and we all appreciated it. And now it's, that would be so rare. Yes. I, 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 you know, I, I, uh, I put my foot in the water for, for pre-med, but I always had this other fascination with photography and video and film. And um, so now it's true. Now I have a doctor's house. I haven't thought about that, but it's, Oh, look at that. But I have to always remind people it's the uh, Dr. Robert and Esther Goddard house. Um, oh, I see. Really, we've really learned a lot about Esther's contribution, which I'm sure we'll talk to later, but yes. Okay. Let's get right into it. How did you acquire the house and what made you want to acquire the house? And let's talk about before I'm I'm jumping ahead, but you are looking to celebrate the first centennial of Robert Goddard March in March of 2026. This is all coming and you're building a wonderful organization that's going to celebrate that in many unique ways, one including his house. Indeed, indeed. Um, oh my gosh. So I was always following Goddard for some strange reason. My uh, mother had given me a miniature version of Robert Goddard's autobiography when I was, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old, something like that. And um, didn't think that much of it, but ended up through fate attending Clark University where Goddard got his PhD and then became the head of the physics department and did all of his 
his rocket research and fired his rocket while he was at Clark University. Uh, subsequently, I ended up teaching at Clark University like he did, not necessarily, uh, you know, really trying to follow in Goddard's footsteps. Um, but I was so fascinated with Goddard and also the fact that he was so unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, I have this great uh, set of interviews that somebody did years ago asking college kids all over the country, who is Robert Goddard? Nobody knows. Really? To this day, to this day outside of the space and aerospace community, he still is unknown and often uh, often kind of titled as the forgotten father of modern rocketry. Oh, gosh. So it always kind of was in the back of my mind that here's this guy who helped humanity get off the planet. And yet every kid knows who Wright brothers are and Thomas Edison and Graham Bell and That's have true. no idea that this, you know, local American kid, um, you know, who was inspired at an early age as I was in terms of the wonders of, of science and technology, um, achieve this incredible event and yet it goes unheralded so it's always that was always the back of my mind and uh, years before i had started to work on a documentary for about goddard um but life got in the way kids were raising kids got in the way etc uh never really kind of got too deep into it but i always thought it was something much needed mm. and, um uh, but i've always been following kind of following goddard and then Subsequently, I was out of town and I read in some local news feed, I think the headline was uh, most historic home in Worcester, Mass. Worcester, Mass is the second biggest city in New England that no one knows about. <laughs> and it was actually known as kind of the, the 1860s Silicon Valley because a lot of invention came out of Worcester. For, for whatever reason. But the, I think the headline was most historic home in, in Worcester unwanted by physicist alma maters. And the article goes on to say that uh, both Clark University, uh, where he, he taught and got his PhD, and WPI, where he did his undergraduate work, were uninterested in purchasing Goddard's house, which had just come up for sale. And so I got really depressed and really saddened. And here's another example of Goddard being unappreciated and unknown. And the house was, a, was gonna be basically destroyed. Um, all the land had already been sold off next to it. They had a big vacant field. Um, and it was during that time of the market where houses were selling in 24 hours or 48 hours, especially mm -hmm. homes that were set up for possible rentals. So uh, the article goes on, they were gonna build a couple of ranch houses on top of the property, <gasps> and then they were gonna turn into a rental or maybe build townhouses. Oh gosh! And I went to bed that night and, you know, very sad. And I woke up the next morning and just said to myself, this can't happen. And called up a friend who's a local realtor in Worcester since I was out of town and said, buy it. And I just kind of crazy. Didn't, didn't even have time to ask my wife. <laughs> you <laughs> so, did not. I did not. <laughs> She'll hold that against me to my grave. Um, <laughs> But it, I knew it had, a, you know, it had to be a very decisive decision. People were already making offers on it. Um, but I knew that in the scheme of things, that posterity would so, so, so be saddened that this happened and that the Goddard House was gone, that I, I just said, I've got to do this. I just paid off my mortgage in my home. Oh, <laughs> so, gosh. So why I, not? I was sitting pretty. And then it was like, here we go again. <laughs> And when was this, Charles? This was, uh, let's see, it was December, let's see, about, uh, I guess a year and a half ago. Uh, oh, recently. recently. Oh my gosh. Okay. How did it unfold? How did it arrive when you did share the news with your wife? Did you at least get into town first and face-to-face -face sit her down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was actually a week or, week or two later because by, oh, by the time you actually make an offer and we went back and forth. Sure. Yeah, the seller was a little dysfunctional. So. Oh, my word. But if anyone knows you and your history and this wonderful progression where you'd step in and out of his life and yours and you go to the same school and you have the same pathways and you keep crossing the paths, then I'm sure it came to no surprise. It meant to be. And it was it was kind of it was kind of tangential to what I've been trying to do with my nonprofit, The Wonder Mission. But yeah. I really I really wasn't quite sure how it all fell together until until the centennial um deadline really kind of oh my gosh um, how did the house come into sale 
it was actually, uh, well, another sad part of the story was uh, Esther Goddard lived uh, much longer than Robert. She was much younger to, than him, and he died fairly early. Um, and she died in 82, and when uh, the house actually had been willed to both Clark University and Worcester Polytech. Oh, really? And for whatever reason at the time, space really wasn't as sexy and cool, you know, in 1982. A lot had been accomplished. Um mm -hmm. They basically said, no, thank you. And so they actually took all the contents of the house and put them on the front lawn and auctioned them off, which was so sad, which is why I think when I read that they were not interested again. Oh my gosh. And, you know, and as a Clark alumnus, I figured I Clark, I can't allow Clark I'm getting, to do this. I'm uh, getting a little heated just thinking, <laughs> I, I'm serious, Charles, because you go down to Huntsville, Alabama, and you go to the Marshall Space Flight Center and the and the US and Rocket Center, right? Museum and it's home of Space Camp, which by the way, any Space Camp graduate, you can stop them on the street and say, do you know who Robert Goddard was? And they will know, right? Mm -hmm. But there they have this beautiful display of Warner Von Braun's office and his papers, and maybe perhaps you've seen it. And as much as I love Warner Von Braun and what he's done for us and to progress in our history, it he was not from the United States. Right. And it just seems like we would have captured and recognized and been a little more, uh, appropriately, you know, right. honoring such a person like Goddard. And when I was growing up in my brief, you know, academics of space and science, Robert Goddard was, you know, not only mentioned, but highly esteemed. So I always thought there was some museum or I always thought there was something that existed. Right. I, I gave, I was giving talks a few years ago in before the Goddard was called it was called Forgotten Goddard. And it was just wow. kind of how, you know, how only in a few places in the country was Goddard appreciated, but also what the Russians did for their so-called father of modern rocketry, Tsiolkovsky, where they have these, you know, 200 foot soaring sculptures into space, oh. the, the Cosmosphere Museum, et cetera. And we haven't quite done enough, but that also kind of uh, energizes me and inspires me when, when you know when there's a sure. dark, a dark. Why? A dark why do you force. think Robert Goddard is forgotten? Is it? Well, I, you certainly part of it. Part of it was uh, was Goddard himself. He became very secretive. Um, uh, what happened in his early career? He wrote an article about the possibility of space travel even before his first successful rocket mm -hmm. launches, and folks like the New York Times lambasted him in this article. And, and uh, I, I, I'll quote it almost word for word. It was like something like, Dr. Robert, despite his chair in physics at Clark University, uh, obviously doesn't know the most basic principles of physics that every high school student knows, that you can't have propulsion in, in a vacuum because there's nothing to push against. And he really took a lot of flack for that. Um, people started to call him the moon man because his theory was we could one day go to the moon even though he never had any intention in his lifetime of being able to do that um, but the great part of that time story is that in 1969 two days before apollo 11 landed on the moon the new york times printed this tiny little article uh that was you know two paragraphs about you know we made a mistake and the times regrets <gasps> this era <laughs> really that's but, good to know. Yeah. But you know, then if you if you go a little further, you realize that the Wright brothers had the same problem when they first did their achievements. No one paid much attention until four or five years later, until they were flying around in Paris, France, and kind of you know in, inspired the country in terms of what you know what what uh, flight could be. Wow. So I'd like to show people who are able to see and not just listening, this incredible photo is one of the most historic and one of my favorites. It really, um, this is the one I think we all recognize traditionally, right. Goddard right. next right. to his stand that held the rocket. And what would you call this officially? So I'm terming it correctly. He actually called every one of his rockets Nelly. Nelly. <laughs> so that was, we never understood. I still haven't found out why why they called it Nelly, but I'm looking looking into it. Um, 
but I think that's just basically his his first successful liquid 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 propulsion rocket. Okay, but, so this is like the holder for in the frame. Yeah, There's no special right. term, right? And the rocket actually just it's it's just kind of you know most people think the frame goes up with the rocket, which I thought until ten years ago. <laughs> But it's really just the rocket, you know, that's just to hold it in place. Okay. Okay, good. And then there's this beautiful artwork, which you've highlighted so well here in the book. Wait, let me center it here. And now this looks like an American hero. Right. I mean, right. this this is a beautiful depiction. His stance, his jawline, <laughs> his, um, you know, looking forward into the horizon and into the future. I love this so much. Not that this is, I mean, this is real and I do love it because anyone who grows up in the, in the winters (laughs) knows that he's not wearing enough (laughs) protective (laughs) clothing, but this definitely aspirational, but kind of, so, you know, so, so, so the Thomas Edison and and the Wright brothers, et cetera, and their illustrations, but I love it. I love this one. And I love, um, I love him with his stance and just kind of the way that he's envisioning and looking, you know, right. cautiously, but optimistically right. captures a lot in that right. beautiful painting. In in reality, they stood behind a, a wooden shield with <laughs> Esther filming it and uh, his assistant, Mr. Sachs, with a stick holding a... Uh, what do they call it? A blowtorch at the end of it. No. Out, and then running away. That's no, that's reality. Right. Oh my goodness. Where did you find this painting? Um, it's it's pretty it's pretty well available. So it's okay. I someone actually gave me a one of those decorative plates recently um uh, that actually had that illustration on it as well. So it must oh my have, gosh. I'm not sure how where where you know uh, how it how it derived. Is this the wooden the wooden uh no actually it was like 20 feet away it was just sort of a piece of a wooden fence at an angle oh my gosh uh, there, there's this wonderful group cgo <laughs> in california and they on their own time self-funded this goddard recreation which i highly recommend people looking at but they they went to the site they did all the measurements and they actually probably more faithfully recorded what really? than anyone else oh um, my gosh and okay, I can well, let's make sure yeah, I can provide you with a link. To that yes, later. I want to make sure I put that into yeah. the show notes. Okay, wow. So as you work professionally, and as you come full circle, constantly touching the points of Goddard's life, you're intrigued, you're inspired. And then what made you full in? So now that you have the house, what are we doing? Is it open to the public? It's open just really by by appointment only. We we have worked, you know, a lot of sweat equity the last couple of years. We've actually got it in pretty good shape. It shows quite nicely. Um, but we're not trying to make it a, a historic house and kind of uh, uh, paying homage that, oh, Robert Goddard sat here and Esther Goddard sat there. Um, we're really trying to have it kind of point more towards the future. Okay. So, so in fact, in the Goddard's dining room, we have a 86 inch monitor and I play footage from the web telescopes most recently oh, to really connect people visiting with the fact that the web telescope was built at NASA's Goddard flight center. And he, you know, that, that they so revered Goddard that their most advanced facility was named after him. Yeah. And that's really kind of what he he fostered in terms of the possibilities. Yes. Oh, that's perfect. Were you able to acquire any of some of the originals or find not, anything not, unique not, in the house? Not really. I mean, in all honesty, I think when things were auctioned off, it was mostly uh, household possessions and lamps and couches, etc. You know, I don't think he did really any full research in the home. That was all done, you know, not, you know only a couple miles away at Clark. And then the launch site is only two miles away at his Aunt Effie's cabbage farm, which is where he <laughs> did all his early experiments. Um, so cool. So really, we're really not trying to, we're trying to give people a feeling of what, what it was like in terms of some period furniture, but we're really trying to, uh, I think some preservation experts that I met with said, we're, we're trying to create the historic house of the future because it really should, it really should more inspire people to dream big um and to point to the future as opposed to looking back to the past i love it 
how perfect. Yeah. And so did you have, had you established the wonder mission prior yeah. to, okay, yeah. what is that? So, um, uh, years ago I became frustrated with what I was seeing out in the world in terms of, uh, tools to get more kids in, interested in science and space. And I was always uh, discouraged by the fact that, that with even what was happening a few years ago, in the last five or six years with science and space exploration, so many people seem disconnected from all the wonders mm -hmm. around them. Um, sure. And I would go to every science and space museum I could go to. And I used to travel a lot for business. And even if I had 20 minutes, I'd run into a science museum to you know, to get my fix, so to speak. And yet I always felt it, that a lot of them weren't necessarily creating that spark that's so needed to get people to the next stage. And and I certainly understand I've done a lot of work for museums over the years and funding is always an issue. Um, and it's always very challenging to do things that the public can touch. But instead of becoming one of those curmudgeons that sits around later in life and says, oh, that stinks and that could be better, et cetera, I sort of told myself, well, shut up. And what would you do? You know, and I've sort of been, I had a company called Wow Inc. for, for ah. many years. And I was sort of known as a wow factor guy. I always use advanced presentation technologies that would get people's attention because if you got people's attention, they could they would listen to your story. Oh, just like you did at H2M, Charles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally and people, you. And people do respond <laughs> positively, um, you know, to to new new and novel stimuli. Yeah, so yeah. Of, I was sort of known for that. So I said, let's let's apply my talents instead of doing it for some trade show or some uh, Chinese World's Fair. Let's see, <laughs> let's see what I could do. So I kind of founded the Wonder Mission, saying, here's some here's some visualizations of of things that I think would wow a six-year-old a 12-year-old yeah. and a 60-year-old um, yeah. you know because in my heart i'm really i really have like a 10-year-old filter you know <laughs> i always feel like if i'm wowed now um i can relate to 10-year-olds but i also can relate to people in their 60s and mm -hmm. 70s in, in yeah. terms of what they need um so i actually kind of you know put to paper spent like a year and a half in my free time as i was beginning to uh look at my career and kind of close down my corporate work. And I really was, became more and more inspired and passionate about this is needed. And as I started to do my homework, I mean, the, the statistics I was reading was so frightening. Uh, the one that stands out the most is the United States is 36 in the world in graduating science and engineering majors. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how could this happen? We used to be the leaders and not to be overly nationalistic, but just, you know, Technology innovation really was what kind of made human beings and the United States progress to where it's gotten to. And in looking around me, I was I was just seeing more and more people struggling with even the STEM and despite the STEM and STEAM resources that are amazing out there, there's this treasure trove of stuff. There wasn't that kind of spark that got people to take that next step and explore them. So I was trying to find ways with existing technology without being too so out there that it could never happen um, of what it would take to kind of ignite people's curiosities. Um, and that's kind of where the Wonder Mission started. Nice. Ignite. Perfect. Oh my goodness. And so the Wonder Mission now is tied to the cent centennial, centennial celebration. And what will be part of that? So, um, I guess the the Wonder Mission as the founding, you know, official 501c3 nonprofit okay. has created two initiatives. One's just called the Robert Goddard Project, which relates to um, the Goddard House, you know, the Goddard story, trying to use the story to inspire more people. You know, what the house will be in the future is still, uh, still undecided um, to, to a certain extent, which is great. Actually, I'm looking forward to getting input from people all over the country in terms of how best do we use this? Oh, you know, yeah. We, does it become a national historic landmark? And, and with that comes certain restrictions. Does it become the Esther and Robert uh, Goddard uh, Innovation Center for, Ooh, sure. for getting, getting people to, to dream big? Um, and the uh, 
the other initiative is the centennial. So when it finally hit me that I don't have my countdown timer up on my computer now, but I look at it usually every morning. Yeah. And I think we're down to like <laughs> 980 days until <laughs> the 100th anniversary of Robert Goddard uh, ushering in the space age with the first modern rocket. And that's March of March, 2026. March 16th of 2026. Oh here, my gosh. Here in Worcester, Mass. Okay. So all of a sudden it it kind of um, uh, sort of blew me away that the clock was ticking. And I had just been to, um, somehow I, I was very lucky. I got a, a VIP pass to the Artemis launch. You did it. Florida. Oh, uh, Wow. Uh, not that I actually saw the launch. I, I know I was going to ask <laughs> the first two attempts. How I, many, how many times did you go? Just, just, just well, I was down there and I just stayed for a bit longer. I, I, I tried twice. Me, oh um, my gosh. Yes. We were probably there together. Yes. yes yeah. Wasn't that, was that the day or one of them when the storms came in right after they called it? Yeah. And you could see them right looming in the back. You're yeah. like, even if it was a go, the storms are like right there. There's just right. no way. It's like go now or no go at all. It was, oh, it was Charles. Still fantastic. But but uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, we got we had a, a big event the night before where all the people that were responsible for the Orion spoke. Wow. And then they actually took us right to the launch site oh, the day wow. before, which was shocking. Um yeah. so that I could actually they'd actually take us there, you know, that that close to launch. Um, but, uh, on that same trip, I had, uh, on the way back, stopped off at Kitty Hawk and stopped off a lot of NASA facilities that were sort of seminal to history of space. And I was really much more inspired than I thought I was going to be, you know, I'm sure. I they, oh. did, they did a really great job there to the point I, I got in the car and I have another, you know, day to drive home. And I bought David McCullough's Wright brothers book and listened to it the whole way back. Did you? Uh, I was going to say, you didn't buy anything in Kitty Hawk, did you? Well, I bought <laughs> Any a lot houses, of real yeah. estate? <laughs> yeah. no, I, I got my mug. <laughs> oh, perfect. I got a, 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 a bolt of right flyer I, I have to build in my in my full retirement. Um, um, but it, it really inspired me. And I, I read a little bit about the centennial when I was at Kitty Hawk. And all of a sudden, I realized tens of thousands of people came. President Bush spoke. Um, they tried to do some reenactments. They ended up having torrential rain, so it was a little bit of a, a mud fest. Um, and they advertised their um, uh, event as first flight centennial. And as I was driving home, I realized, see, that's great. The Wright brothers helped get humanity off the ground. Yeah. And it occurred to me that our Robert Goddard really took the first steps in getting humanity off to the planet to the point where an interstellar space uh -huh. voyagers are still way out there beaming back data that's you know 30 years later than they ever thought we'd you know they'd be working um but it seemed like gee what a what a fantastic opportunity not only to celebrate goddard uh or to celebrate you know a deceased you know inventor uh and i'm not a really that not much of a history buff um, in many ways, where some people can spend their whole life sure. going backwards. Oh, sure. I've always been more of a futurist. But wouldn't this be a great chance for the centennial to certainly honor humanity's first efforts to get off the ground, but also let's honor all the modern day Goddards, all the young scientists and engineers that are helping make these achievements that can figure out how to fly a helicopter on Mars with no atmosphere. Um, how to um, create a vaccine within a year. Let's celebrate all these big, big idea folks and these dreamers and visionaries and all the engine, you know, these young kids, you look back at uh, a SpaceX launch or Blue Origin launch, you know, Mission Control, and you see all these brilliant young people who have spent their lifetimes working tirelessly, doing a lot of boring stuff sometimes yeah. to make things happen. And especially now more than ever, where science is being challenged in the craziest, craziest ways, it's really time to stand up and make these folks our new rock stars, our new heroes. Here, you know, here. We shouldn't be, mm -hmm. we shouldn't necessarily spend as much time on the Kardashians and Snoop Dogg <laughs> as we should on these brilliant people that are accomplishing 
Sure. Amazing stuff in record time. And they 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 often go unsung. You know, you get a you get a few of the superstars here and there, and that's it. So I'm hoping the centennial will uh certainly uh, honor Goddard, uh kind of kind of reinvigorate the Goddard story of what a young kid who was inspired at 17 could eventually do. Um, but also um uh, create create all really create a movement i mean ideally yeah. certainly i'd love to do things locally love to do things by the house uh love to do things at the launch site but in a perfect world every science museum in the united states and every even every elementary and high school should be kind of somehow integrating the centennial once they kind of get in their minds something big is going to happen yeah it's such a wonderful story and it it connects to so much of what's happening today, and we're certainly looking forward to the future. Um, and I'm hoping it just becomes something where no one even knows about me or Worcester or the Goddard House, but kind of see this opportunity to somehow celebrate it in their own unique and create what creative way. I see. Um, and that yeah. would be that to me. That would be success if we okay. can inspire one kid or a thousand kids or one museum or 500 museums to kind of uh, s celebrate that centennial and use it to their best advantage to get more people excited about absolutely you know, the wonder the wonders all around us that we seem disconnected from. absolutely well i hate to tell you charles but i have a feeling there's going to be a lot of ongoing growing excitement as people get closer to the centennial and they might um you might want to have like a an event planner in your pocket. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so woefully unprepared for this challenge. <laughs> that well, I, I, I know things are coming along, but it's, you're right. Um, I, I do want to ask a follow-up. Sure. So Clark, let's go back to Clark university. Now, have they decided to be participatory or supportive or now that it can be I privately? I approached them at the highest levels yet, but I've certainly been working uh, the Clark archivists and the Clark librarian have been terrific. Oh, so I've been spending every two weeks, I go down to the Clark archives and I've been scanning all of Goddard's photographs and negatives at the highest oh, possible. Oh, wow. Um, which hasn't been done before. So that when the centennial comes or for, or for posterity, that people have as, uh, access to Clark's incredible archives. I mean, they oh, don't my gosh. copyright for a lot of stuff, but they're very giving for any any purposeful reason yeah. so we're slowly working our way through but i've as i said i've been been holding off an official launch in a really big way okay uh, and, and, but it's it's coming it's, think, coming. Uh, it's coming it's coming it's good coming. So, teams I, and volunteers and yeah. interested people i'm sure they're going to want to try to find you and get a hold of you and support the wonder project where can they do that i think the simplest way is just the uh just the website for the moment that we're actually uh, in the process of redesigning, we should have up by mid-August. Um, but it's it's active right now. It's there's we don't have a donation page or anything set up yet. But it's thewondermission.org. Okay. And they can reach me at charles at thewondermission.org. Okay. Um, something surprising about Goddard as we wrap up that maybe people don't know. You've already shared a lot, uh, especially about how he was so quiet. And maybe not um, looking for recognition or, you know, to be put on this pedestal, certainly. But is there anything that would surprise us, especially kiddos, as they start digging into learning more about Robert Goddard as they get closer to the centennial? What, well, what really fascinated me, once again, late in the game, is that he wasn't just a rocket science. He was this incredible visionary. He has a patent for something called the vacuum train, which is a actual accurate depiction of what today's hyperloop is. And because he really? was doing experiments of how propulsion could work in a vacuum, he built these giant vacuum tubes to fire things in. He recognized, gee, you could actually have a train move in a tube from city to city at incredibly high speeds like at the bank teller except your deposit yeah. is the train yeah. car and you zoom right through and it is the hyperloop that everyone's proposing to do nowadays no uh, kidding he also experimented with solar power for terrestrial transmission from space to power cities 
he also was experimenting with ion propulsion, which now at NASA is mm. beginning to implement for, for some spacecraft. Um, so he really was kind of much more, he, he did an article called um, Centauri Dreams. He wrote this paper where he talked about interstellar travel, um, hibernation for astronauts, what it would take for people to travel long distances. Oh, yeah. And it all goes back to, he was 15, 16, 17, reading science fiction, reading H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Um, oh, sure. Which was, and he actually uh, had communicated with H.G. Wells later in life. But um, there's one terrific story of Goddard that most people don't know. And it's it's part of what we're, we're hoping to honor at the, uh, at the centennial. So um, at 17, he was a sickly kid. He had tuberculosis. He went into high school at like... 17 years old. Um, mm. He was a late starter. He was home, home for a long time. Um, and he had this favorite cherry tree on the property that, you know, I can provide you pictures of that, you know, had a little homemade ladder, a little no trespassing sign that a kid <laughs> put on like his, like his tree fort. But he's up in the tree one cold October night. And he had just finished reading H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. And he had this epiphany and he looked up and Mars, you know, the before the days of light pollution, Mars is bright and red, and the, you know, the, the cosmos is before him, and he has this epiphany. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could someday build a device that would take us to Mars and beyond? And he comes down from that cherry tree, and he writes in his journal, which he he wrote in every day of his life. Um, I, you know, he's found his purpose, <sighs> and he's now a different boy than he was when he came down from the tree. Really? Every year he celebrated um, March, I'm gonna, I hope I don't foul this up, I think it's March 18th uh, as his anniversary day. And in 1938, the tree was destroyed by this 38 hurricane. And he writes in his journal, cherry tree destroyed by hurricane must go on alone. Which oh my I thought gosh. Was just, just a marvelous, marvelous little story. Wow. The power yeah. of story, both his own and then his influence, the influence of story on him who, you know, we all, we all look to the Apollo landing um, for a lot of our influences and validation for all of our work and accomplishments as humans getting off planet for, but for a person like Goddard back before when there was just science fiction stories to point to, right? Wow. Wow. And he did it by himself. I mean, he really had one or two assistants in his lifetime and they banged these things together, you know, down in the physics department. When they blew up, they'd take what they had and scavenge it and put it back together. I think um, Jeff Bezos in the uh, book, uh, The Space Barons, is quoted as saying he was so inspired by, by Goddard and also by Goddard's uh, methodology, his slow persistence. Mm. And undauntingly moving ahead all the time. He named his uh, Blue Origin's first test rocket was Goddard. Uh, Star Trek space shuttle, one of, one of their shuttles is called Goddard. Um, but he actually, in the book, they say he named one of his son's middle names is Goddard. After oh, Robert gosh. Goddard. So, oh, wow. Uh, so That's a little, profound. Little Goddard factoids. But. That's so great. Oh, my goodness, Charles. I cannot wait between now and the centennial. We need to have you back because Thanks. there's so much to learn. People will start to get to know Robert Goddard in unique ways and maybe read some of the uh, biographies that have been written and stories. So can we have you back on the show? Oh, and as we get questions, you can help us. I'd, I'd love to. And and you can help me um, because I feel like I'm, I'm just a very quiet voice. I'm the Paul Revere of the centennial. <laughs> okay. The centennial is coming. You know? Yes, of course. Um, but I think just kind of letting people celebrate it in their own way, just because it's just a fabulous <laughs> opportunity to celebrate science. And this hundredth, you know, what, what blows me away the most, and maybe I'll just leave with this is, you know, nowadays it's sometimes it's hard to be hopeful. And I think I said earlier, space, I think does bring out the best in us, as Bill Nye says, but also can make us very hopeful in terms of what human beings can achieve. But when you think about the Wright brothers in 1903 first flight, and then um, 23 years later, Robert Goddard fires off the first modern rocket, and 43 years later, we landed on the moon. I mean, what human beings can do when... <laughs> 
when they have competition, certainly it was it was motivated by by the space race and, and Russia's accomplishments. But to go from this primitive, rickety, you know, bomb bomb on a stick, pretty much, <laughs> to landing on the moon in 43 years, uh, makes you wonder of where we could be 43 years from now if we continue this space, uh, this this uh, this evolution and pace, and especially if we can inspire more young people um, to pursue the sciences and and all the offshoots that come certainly with space exploration. Charles, thank you for being our ambassador for Robert Goddard in a big way. Thank you for sharing all this information and for the Wonder Project. And we're going to put all the links into the show notes. People will learn more. And then before we start the celebration, and as you start solidifying plans, come back and join us. And I can't wait for kids to enjoy learning more about okay. this unique American hero. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very open to suggestion. We're hoping to have some sort of a symposium. It might just be virtual next fall on the on the Cherry Tree Anniversary Day. Oh, and get people from all over the country to talk about ways they might celebrate the centennial. Um, certainly have people come by in person, um, but also uh, come up with best practices for the Goddard House. Oh, that would be great little open source uh, opportunities there, citizen science and recommendations. That is yeah. so kind of you. No, oh, no, it's Charles. Great. It's great. It's all, it's, you know, it's, it's been inspiring um, in many ways, but the best part of what's happened to me is the people I've met on this journey. And I've, you know, I visited the Goddard Flight Center in, uh, in Maryland and to have all these people that so, revere and appreciate Goddard and are appreciative of some of the things we're trying to do. And if you go to the new Air and Space Museum, they just spent a billion dollars redoing it, only half of it is open. But when you go into the new lobby and they have this fabulously large holding area that brings you into the building, there's only one exhibit right now and it's Robert Goddard's rocket in the middle of the oh. space. And so that was kind of, that was kind of as validating as you're going to get. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. And thank so, you, Charles, for my pin. I wear it with pride. Yeah. It's very exciting and supporting the wonder mission is going to be what we're going to do here on casual space. So listeners make sure you go check it out. Thank you, Charles, for sharing good luck and success to you as we get towards the countdown. And then we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Beth. And thank you for all, all the efforts. Um, that you're doing it makes it makes a big difference in this world. I and mean, I know you, you, you've, you've touched a lot of people and inspired a lot of people yourself. So bravo. Oh, thank you. All right. We'll see you again soon, Charles. Cool. Cool. cool.